Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. If you're not a historian of the Gilded Age, Progressive Era, or generally speaking, the 19th century, you probably never thought much about railroads. In fact, you probably just think they're a system of transportation, and really nowadays an old technology, maybe even obsolete in some rural parts of the world where they no longer run. On the other hand, if you've given any thought to railroads, you would see them as the equivalent to the internet, a transformative technology that changed everything about our lives in the 19th century. And if you studied railroads in any depth, you'll know that modern American capitalism and corporations begin with the advent of railroads. How businesses operate and limit liability is entirely a manifestation of the railroad. So is the growth of the American West in the planning of towns, the creation of leisure time, restaurants, hotels, and the very notion of luxury. If you've ever delved any deeper beyond that, you might even know that railroads are responsible for creating time. And by that, I mean the standard of time, time zones, and a common time that we can all agree on. What I mean by that is that when a train came into town, it set the time for deliveries and collections. So people no longer really operated their day by the dawn or the the fall of the sun. They set themselves by the schedule of the trains. Now, if that doesn't make your mind melt a little, turn off the podcast now because nothing in the next 40 minutes will. If, however, if you think this all sounds a little impressive, do join me for a great conversation about the rise of railroad empires across the American West, from Topeka to Los Angeles and Denver to Mexico City. I'm joined today by John Sedgwick, the best-selling author of several books, perhaps most notably Blood Moon, an American epic of war and splendor in the Cherokee Nation, And his other book that's uh, probably one of his most famous ones is The War of Two, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and the Duel that Stunned the Nation. He's one of those authors that puts the reader in the minds of the historical characters and paints a landscape portrait on the contextual canvas. Warm welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with you. Well, I'm delighted to have you here because uh, From the River to the Sea uh, does such an impressive job of telling the story the central story of the railroads in the late 19th century American society. And your story takes in a lot of characters, but it centers on these two resolute businessmen. One is William Barstow Strong and the other is General William Jackson Palmer. Why did these two stand out to you? Well, they're such a wonderful study in contrasts. And also they give you the full reach of capitalism in the 19th century. Now, um, one of them that William Jackson Palmer that you um, mentioned was very much in the heroic mold of the old school, a pre-industrial society in many respects, that he wanted to run his company like a sole proprietorship, that as if he alone could handle everything and that would be enough. That uh, William Barstow Strong, and that his um, his railroad was the, um, obviously the the Denver and Rio Grande, known as the Rio Grande, that, and that it was based in Denver, Colorado. We'll talk more about that later. But then there was William Barstow Strong, who was a manager. He was not an owner, and that he was a manager of one of these new uh, um, economic constructs. Um, called a corporation, which really had not existed uh, um, to that extent uh, um, in the, uh, before the 1870s when he started getting involved in this firm um, called the uh, um, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, which was based not in Atchison, nor in Topeka, uh, nor in Santa Fe, but in Boston. Uh, um, and this was uh, the um, the emerging style of the corporate structure, that it was detached from its operations. It, it was a place to hold and, um, and, and increase your money. Uh, um, it was an investment vehicle, uh, um, much uh, much more than it was a transportational device. The, um, so those were the two two um, the approaches. And of course, uh, um, being the, uh, a sole proprietorship, the uh, Jackson um, William Jackson Palmer Palmer General Palmer, uh, a Civil War general and a hero in the Civil War, 
that he had to keep his small if he was going to you know, um, be able to manage it all. And of course, in the landscape of the West, which was huge, small didn't really work, uh, um, and you needed big. But we can get into that. That that was the that was the overriding uh, distinction between those two men. I think the great thing about your book is that you wind up rooting for one of them. And I don't know if you were rooting for one or the other. I was definitely rooting for Palmer more than Strong, maybe because it was that, you know, sole proprietor versus corporate behemoth. Um, but it also seems like there's a difference with the sources that you had to grapple with as well. I mean, you've got this really great story about Palmer and his personal life. And then you've got Strong, who seems a little vaguer, I guess. Is that is that just because of what you had to work with? Um, yes and no. I mean, it, it's interesting that just as you say, there were there are a lot of books on Palmer. Now, um, there's a biography that his daughter arranged uh, um, to have uh, written and published, and um, that there, but and that there are a number of accounts of this great romantic marriage that um, that, that he had, um, and that there was so much uh, romance and, and excitement now um, that that was associated with him now um, in Colorado. He sort of embodied the West and, and uh, the romance and possibility of it, the expanse, the glory, the beauty, the majesty, the poetry. And all of that was reflected in his writing, uh, um, which is why I think he was has been so attractive to writers through the years. Strong, on the other hand, was, quote unquote, just a manager. And it, it, one of the things that is interesting about history is that history goes towards and rewards those for whom there are the most documents. If your letters are recorded, if you keep journals and they are left in a safe place, and if other people write about you um, in their own accounts, the chances are that history will favor you and that, that you will be remembered. And even those who have accomplished more, uh, and I would say that Strong accomplished a lot more than Palmer, if the records don't uh, survive and they aren't detailed, you will be forgotten. And that, that is definitely been the fate of William Barstow Strong. Uh, he, uh, not to tip my hand, but that he was, uh, as a corporate leader, that he was in a far more powerful position. He had much more capital behind him and he was in a much um, better shape in order to achieve his goals than Palmer was. And part of Palmer's appeal, I think, is the fact that he was up against it, that he didn't have endless resources. He had only himself, really, to rely on his his wit, his ingenuity, um, and his um, uh, you know the the power of his own personality, and that that was really the engine that was pulling the, um, the Rio Grande. On the other hand, the, the strong the, had a genuine engine. He had powerful locomotives. He had this um, deep financial resource of the corporation so that it wasn't so much a matter of him. And that as a result, the people didn't pay him his due. It was really more the corporation that got its due. And with both these men, that there have been, you know, dutiful historians before me have gone through the corporate records. God loved them for doing this. Uh, these endless archives uh, of uh, um, the, the you know annual reports that um, uh, um, surveys from the field and it, you you can't believe how much stuff there was uh, um, for these two guys the, um, the the people who wrote these corporate histories to go through um, um, and that that really to them that was the story uh, the the corporate story it it wasn't so much the individual but in this case the individual uh, one individual. His, his record was enhanced by uh, these other biographies. And for that reason, I think that you feel more uh, um, that for uh, General Palmer as you go through the story uh, um, than you do for uh, Strong, although I think that he does have his moment toward the end. It's a fascinating uh, pairing, and uh, they obviously so hated each other. But there's another person that comes in about halfway through the story as well who sort of disrupts all of this, and that's Jay Gould, who's the mercurial robber baron, probably best known for manipulating commodity markets and, you know, shaking down other Gilded Age kingpins. How important of a role does he play in the strong Palmer rivalry? And, and maybe you could tell us how he involves himself. 
Well, man, his entry into this story was just such a kabump kind of moment. It's like the you know when in Jaws when <laughs> when they finally uh, um, sense that the shark is out there. That that was the feeling that people had when they sensed that Gould was in the waters. That um, this was a man, a tiny little guy, five foot two, wispy voiced uh, um, and, and tubercular. Now, and you would think that he would be a total total loss in the hurly-burly of industrialized America, particularly in the form of the railroads, which were the only, which were the major economic action at the time. Uh, um, So anyway, so Gould comes on the scene, um, and one of the things that he does is make clear that big as strong and Palmer thought they were themselves, and as important as they thought their lines were, they were very small potatoes in, in the larger scheme of things that, that Gould was fully on top of. Yeah, and so the you know, Gould saw these two guys as sort of fly specks to be sort of kicked away. And if, it, if they come on this, he comes on the scene, as you say, late in the story, that just after the Gould and Strong had spent two years fighting each other to try and take control of the Royal Gorge Pass that would lead up to the richest silver mine in the West, a place called Leadville. Terrible, terrible misnomer, Leadville. Why don't they just call it Dullsville and, and be done with it? Uh, I mean, what a what a curious name to settle on for such. I mean, this was not just the richest silver mine in the West, but probably the richest silver mine in the world. Uh, um, to, in their mind, this was a, a worthy target, both of these men, and which is why they competed so forcefully um, over. Um, for two years, not just in the courts, as you would expect, but as a military matter, where they actually aimed guns at each other across this royal gorge, this towering gorge is like 1,500, maybe 2,000 feet high, going straight up from the Arkansas River. Very difficult place to build, but a place where you could build only one single set of tracks. Anyway, so that goes on for two years, and they're at an impasse. The Supreme Court has ruled they've the, there's been a military intervention. They have uh, um, shot their wad in the court of public opinion. They're stymied. This thing is just not going anywhere. What are they going to do? And then Gould comes on the scene, and literally in an hour, he has this thing sorted out. Um, he says to um, one party, I won't say which, uh, um, that you stay to the south, the other party stay to the north, this party gets the, um, the route to Leadville, the other party gets the route to um, across the southwest, and, um, and accept these terms in totalitary, or I will ruin you. They do sign. Uh, um, and what was so brilliant about it was the It settled a matter that was utterly intractable. The two men could not settle by themselves. The military couldn't, they had a kind of, um, they assembled enough soldiers so that it became a a kind of uh, army uh, of railroad men who were well armed and ready to kill. um, So there was that angle, but then there was also the the legal angle where, as I say, it went to the Supreme Court. You would think that would settle the matter, but it didn't um, because in those days, and perhaps still, the, the man who has the most money and the most power will win in the end. Uh, um, and that was true then, and sadly, it's it's rather true now. The man who had the most money was Gould. Uh, um, that, that, so that what was brilliant was that it appeared that he was just settling this dispute for the two men. But he was actually settling, settling the dispute in a way that was most favorable to him. And that was all disguised. He didn't actually enter into this document. His name was not on it, but that he was able to set things up so that for him, it was perfect. I'm so glad you didn't give away the uh, the way the book ends because um, it, it's it's it goes it goes on much longer into the the ongoing fight between Strong and Palmer. So uh, we know Gould is going to win out in his own way, of course. But right. I'm glad you didn't give away the ending because that keeps no. it uh, keeps it uh, for for everyone who's going to read the book. Yeah. Um, okay. So that what you're describing there about Gould and the, the the West and what he's trying to preserve for himself is the thing that really got me about your book was this idea of space in the West. And you you kind of talk about that and you know your 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 writing is so uh vivid um that at, at times the West seems at once airy 
and open and yet sometimes so claustrophobic. Is that is that a fair assessment? That's a wonderful description of it because it was claustrophobic for the two men, even if as it couldn't have been more wide open, in fact. And this all had to do with one of the quirks of capitalism, uh, um, at least as it applied to railroad building across the West. It, it was very difficult to determine the value of any individual route, given that the whole uh, uh, West was so wide open with so few obvious targets of interest. There were so, I mean, Denver at 5,000, um, as a population of 5,000, was probably the most significant, in fact, certainly the most significant town in the area that they were fighting for. Well, so that it, clearly you wanted to connect to Denver, but where else did you want to go? Did you really want to go to Santa Fe, um, which was then a city of 3,000 that was hovering, that was far enough away from anything that, um, that it may not have been so valuable in and of itself, even though this, the Santa Fe Railroad had actually put it in its name as a potential target. Uh, um, and you had other you know, problems that, you know, chiefly the fact that in, in, in truth, that the West was not wide open. It was the territory of Native Americans who had every right to resist and be, feel affronted and outraged and murderous towards these white invaders who were taking their land. And here's another thing where capitalism comes into it because um, to the Native Americans, the, the Sioux, the Shawnee, uh, and Apaches, uh, and the others that were there, uh, um, that they were they were nomads essentially, and they never set down. They never they didn't create towns. They were basically roaming around uh, um, in pursuit of buffalo, where the buffalo went, they went, and it never occurred to them to try and own the land. It, it was not in their mindset. It was as preposterous an idea as if somebody wanted to own sunlight or the wind. That would be like, how could you possibly own the land? And how could it possibly be that a mere piece of paper that would testify to your ownership of the land? And how could you then, on the basis of that paper, kick somebody else out who had been there for generations beyond counting? Anyway, so this was another another concern of theirs, uh, um, at, uh, of the railroad men, and it and also spoke to um, their state of mind and the state of um, of you know let's call it white supremacy at the time, where it never occurred to them that never once occurred to them that the they that the Native Americans might have a point. Uh, um, no, they, they were savages and hazards and that they needed to be essentially uprooted, removed and exterminated if they couldn't make peace with these white settlers. And the, you know, and the, to assist them, there were any number of military outposts uh, um, all across the West, and their sole purpose was to preserve the, um, these white adventurers, namely the railroads, you know, and and say and protect them from the Indians who were bent on holding them off. Anyway, so the, so that was the Indian side of it. So the question was in the West, where to lay down track, tracks. Uh, um, and that there are all sorts of, you know, yes, there was the Indian hazard, but there was also the hazard of, uh, um, you know, floods, hurricanes. Uh, um, the, the West has wild weather. Um, and uh, a lot of what, it, there, it was just incredibly expensive to build across the West. Uh, um, there wasn't that much labor. So there was a lot going on and, and that it was very high risk enterprise. And so it came back to the question that I raised at the beginning, where to put the tracks? Well, one way to decide where to put the tracks is to think that the other guy had decided to put it along this particular line. And that that, more than anything else, testified to its value. And that if somebody else was going to do it, then you should do it, and you should do it first. Uh, um, so a lot of this railroad war between these two men that went on for a decade was really a game of spy versus spy, that where they were each trying to divine the intentions of the other uh, and act on them before the other man could. Yeah, I, I what I really like the line in the book that you use to describe the way that the railroads develop is that they, that they don't rise alone and that there's this um, 
this sort of constant competition, you know, spy versus spy, as you say. I mean, the descriptions of how the two companies effectively spied on each other and 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 mirrored each other is remarkable. The other thing I think that you're trying to get across in the whole um, they don't rise alone is that there's a number of ancillary businesses and industries that rise right. with the railroads. Um, I, I, I wonder if you could say a little something about that, because what you paint in the story is about towns erupting out of nowhere, exactly. as if, yes. as if, as if, you know, as if the railroads made these towns and they, and they did in many ways, right? They absolutely did. It's far more true to say that the railroads were in the real estate business than they were in the transportation business, that they prospered not on ticket prices or even freight prices, but they prospered far more on real estate prices. And, and, and for this, they had every reason to do that. They, if they went to um, site X in the wilderness someplace and delivered it a train, the site X property values increased exponentially. And a lot of, and that was entirely the doing of the railroad. So I think that they had every right uh, to buy up the land for cheap and then sell it at a higher price once the railroad came in. And, and that was what they did time and again. And that beyond that, they became um, real estate developers themselves and that they would often they, um, lay out the, the plan of the town well ahead of the arrival of the railroad and that they would lay it out in, in almost invariably in the exact same way. They would lay down the grid. The grid is what we know here in, the, in the, uh, New York as the pattern of Manhattan, but it was really the pattern of, of the United States as a whole, except for the agrarian South. Uh, the, these, when I say the grid, I mean the avenues going, uh, um, say, across town, the um, streets intersecting it um, at 90 degrees uh, at intervals along the way. It was sort of a cookie cutter approach to town building where every town basically was the same. And then to show it was the same and to show what the power was behind it, almost invariably, the train would set its own station that exactly in the middle of town and, and that it would move significantly you know, um, all the churches to the outskirts because onto land that was far less valuable, showing the, um, the true divinity in the West was the train. And it would actually have its um, clock tower um, be the what I thought of as the new cross. It was the dead center in town. And it was also, and what's interesting to me is that it brought a time consciousness to the West that it did not previously have. Uh, um, previously, the, the day was determined by when the sun went up and went down and that the year was determined by the seasons as they turned. Not when the trains got there. When the trains got there, the time was calibrated to the minute because you had to be at the train station in time to get the train. And then as the train went west, the, the whole country had to reimagine its own sense of time. And I hadn't realized this, maybe you did. The, before the trains um, came in in the 1880s, I mean, came in sweepingly. Uh, um, the town was very much, uh, the time was a local affair, that each town had its own time, literally. that They had something called a time ball, that at the exact noon, when the sun was at the very highest in the sky, the, the time ball would drop, and that was noon in that place. Well, 20 miles outside of that, that noon was a different time because the sun was getting there 20 minutes later, and that was noon for them. Well, and that got confusing when the trains came in and started taking people all across the country, and people had to change their watches multiple times along the way, and also they had to figure out the, um, what time it was, you know, at any individual place, and they also needed to coordinate this with the sun's 
passage across the uh, across the West. And so, sure enough, they came up with the notion of railroad time, which is what the, um, we actually live with today, with the four the, um, time zones across the West. That was a railroad uh, imposition, and and in fact, uh, there was a lot of resistance to it. That they thought that the sun had been displaced from the sky, and that now the railroads were the ones determining what time it was. That it used to be that the sun and the sundial would do it. And I, I mean, I just find that remarkable as well as sort of a, a holdover from the Gilded Age that we, you know, we, we're, we're, we still have today. Your, your story about time is fascinating as well because it's not just, and, and urban planning as well, is that it was really oppressive for people, both the time and the urban planning. You've got two great stories in the book about how the grid was sort of, they, they tried to tinker with the grid, uh, new urban planners, and it was completely sidelined, right? That was- uh, Absolutely. The, the, um, they, they brought in Olmsted, the great designer of Central Park, now, um, to the design a plan for Topeka, which was, uh, I mean, not Topeka, uh, um, Tacoma. So that he had this lovely uh, um, plan to build around the edges uh, of the hills and have the, the town sort of graciously embrace nature. The railroad company looked at that and said, are you kidding me? <laughs> we're not going to do that. We're going to impose the grid here. And there, wherever there's a hill, we'll just chop out a bit of the grill, the grid, and that we won't uh, employ there. So, and that was true with rivers. That, um, the, they put down the grid, and if there was a river running through it, they would just stop right on the edge of the river and then pick up on the other side now, um, and, and just say, okay, well, sure, there's a river, but we're not going to like bend around to let people look at the river or walk along the river or um, appreciate the river. No, 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 no. This is all about the railroads and the railroads have to be at the center and the, rate, the streets run parallel to that and, 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 they, and perpendicular to that. And that's the way it went, okay? We got this. And so every city in the West uh, um, is like that. And it, it's amazing to me that one of the things that's so striking about the West uh, um, is is variability, you know, the extremes, uh, um, deserts here, mountains there, enormous chasms, the Grand Canyon, the scale of it is, is so magnificent. And and yet uh, the, when the railroads came in, nah, <laughs> that doesn't matter, forget it. Nah, we're not even gonna look at that stuff. Uh, um, the, here's what we're doing. This is a commercial enterprise, you got that? And that, and that because it was in this cookie cutter fashion, it made it that much easier to develop, that everybody knew exactly what they were getting. That if it was the, the main uh, um, street through town, that was going through the middle and it was going to hit the railroad. And so if you bought along there, that's what you were going to get. No funny business, that, um, no curving streets, that, um, that nothing that might make you wonder, well, how is this one different from that one? You don't actually have to go there to, to buy it or to know what you're getting. You can picture it just so easily. And it, and it extended actually not just to the to the individual squares, but to the individual lots on those squares. Uh, um, so, and they were all exactly the same. I think it was 40 by 60 in, in almost all cases, which dictated a certain kind of house. And the, and the style of the house was usually inspired by the style of the railroad. Uh, um, so that, it, you know, if something was Adobe, uh, as it was in Santa, Santa Fe, Adobe became the standard for the town as it is today. Now, um, and the, the, the effects of the railroads that, you know, cannot be overstated. And I, I think that it's just so apparent from the first page. I mean, you, you take us to Los Angeles in the first couple of pages, and then you, you, you finish up explaining how, I mean, I would have thought Hollywood in the early 20th century was really how the town made its mark, but you rightly, you know, put that into perspective and say it's the, it's the railroads and and I think that those are the other things that come out of the book as well is not just the urban planning and the oppression of that but some of the beautiful and cultural artifacts of that period are things like opera houses and new and amazing hotels and leisure and entertainment in ways that we never had before tell us a little bit about why LA inspired you to to, to write more about this well I was just amazing uh, amazed to think of uh, um, just as you say that, that LA was a railroad town. 
I mean, who who would have thought? It, you just imagine that it was created by Cecil B. DeMille or Matt um, Griffiths or someone. But what's amazing about LA is the you know, a lot of uh, so much else of it was in fact the product of the railroad. That and the oranges, for example, um, which you associate with Los Angeles and Southern California, were, were a creation of, of the railroads because when the railroads came in, the oranges could come out and they could be distributed to every corner of the country. And they also just by and that they were able to capitalize on a distinct um, Los Angeles virtue and Southern California virtue, which is the sunshine that um, and the glorious climate. It was a climate that was perfect for the orange. And then the orange, at least in my mind, perfectly um, represented and symbolized Southern California and Los Angeles in particular. So that so that when the railroads that, um, that exported you know, so many oranges and they'd come out in the box loads, I think that there were it was two million boxes by the turn of the century. It was just an extraordinary number. They completely eclipsed Florida, which had been the world champion. Um, and that when those oranges went out to breakfast tables all around America, people looked at this and then tasted it. And they were tasting Southern California and seeing the sunshine in it. That this was, a, a, you know, there couldn't have been better merch uh, um, it, to symbolize uh, um, the, the place where it came from. And then on top of that, that once the oranges got going, then, then the lemons and citrus fruits, you know, were added in. And before you know it, Southern California was the orchard of America. It was also the garden of America because they, these uh, um, they, they quickly moved into gardens, roses in particular, Pasadena's. And it, what I loved also about the Rose Parade it, you know, my father, it, by an amazing quirk, uh, um, played in the Rose Bowl game uh, of, uh, um, of 1920 uh, um, when he was at Harvard College of all places. He was, it was a game, uh, Harvard versus Oregon State, and uh, that, you know, 20,000 people were in the stands, which was an amazing number. Now, um, but it was all, it was the Rose Bowl, obviously in Pasadena. And why was um, the Pasadena associated with roses. Well, Ro Pasadena wanted to show the world that even on January 1st, when the Northeast was shivering, that Pasadena was glorious and warm and there were roses there. So it was a combination of thumb in the eye to New Yorkers, but also the biggest come on you ever knew because they would be hearing about the wonderful sunshine <laughs> on January 1st, which has to be the bitterest day uh, um, in Manhattan because uh, you know the snow is coming down and it's 20 below or whatever. And, and there they are in their shirt sleeves in Pasadena and you know about it no, because they've got this Rose Bowl parade in our Rose Bowl game. It was all calculated. It that was not a coincidence that, that Pasadena grew on the strength of its roses and its advertisements for its roses. And one of the things that I was most moved by was how much of the West depended on the great American dream of better tomorrow. That, that over, this is, I mean, you, you're in Ireland, you can tell me that better, but it seems like in America, what it means, what the pioneer spirit really means is that there's a kind of optimism to it. If you go just a little farther, life will get a little better. You go beyond the, onto the other side of that hill, it's gonna be better on the other side of that hill. And if it isn't, there's another hill, we'll go beyond that one and we'll find it. If it's a search, you know, when Jefferson wrote about the pursuit of happiness, I think that in the back of his mind uh, that he was thinking of the pioneer spirit, that everybody in America has come here from someplace else. And they've come in search of something that in most cases they didn't find where they landed. That, and so they have kept this an extraordinary mobile society or has been, and that they're cost and that they look to the West because this country started in the East with European immigrants who come along the Eastern coast. And then they go a little further into the Midwest and discover, oh my God, it's so flat here. I've got to keep going. And, and then they end up and they go all the way to the sea, ultimately, where indeed, I think California of all the states in the union is the one that I think still remarkably is most associated with paradise. That is what they're selling. 
I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the things in the book that stood out to me, especially, well, you, you, you bring up Frederick Jackson Turner, which was a great addition to the book, I think. Because, and for anyone who's unsure who Turner is, he's one of the foremost US historians credited with the frontier thesis, which is the idea that America and Americans were forged by that westward expansion that you're, you're describing. Uh, by 1893, Turner, and this is of course, just as uh, Los Angeles is really opening up, Turner, yeah. uh, Turner, uh, you know, declares the frontier closed, that it's been settled and that the West is kind of not as rugged or, or the frontier is not available to America anymore. And as you point out, Turner doesn't actually talk about the railroads an awful lot in his frontier thesis. So, I, and this sort of made me think about today because, you know, there's conversations that we're ignoring finance and business and we're, we're not paying enough attention to that as historians. And I wonder if you think there's any truth in that from all the way back in Turner's time uh, to today, are we paying enough attention to these businesses? You know, that's a brilliant question. Um, and, and it speaks to something that, you know, there, there's this, the quest for America's soul is going on right now. And one of the reasons that the soul is so hard to find is the, the soul, the, there are two competing visions of America and it will, they'll never be resolved. And one is that the soul is a matter of an individual and that, that it's an individual usually who has been tested by this rugged, difficult environment that is America, like all environments. And that the pioneers embodied the best of America, that they went west and they took on the quote unquote savages and they battled in climate, no, um, no, climates and that they uh, tilled the soil and that they laid down the no, um, railroad tracks and they did this all, you know, at, at, like mountain men. It, all, it was all just themselves alone or with their families. Uh, the um, little house on the prairie is, is kind of the emblem of but there's another view of it, which is that actually um, the, the American story is one of technology, uh, of capital, um, of large groups, of government, uh, um, uh, of, P of power, um, and the, that has um, created America, and that any notion that it was an individual effort is just ridiculous uh, um, because uh, it, it, it wasn't that those individuals may have thought that they were doing this on their own but if you look at it that, that they were the products that uh, you know first of all they were installed in the west uh, with some convenience by railroads and the the towns that they occupied so bravely were created for them by railroads that uh, they're as we mentioned that their wrist watches if they had them in their pocket watch was the time was set by the railroads and that i mean it's I mean, it's amazing to me that turner could have just sort of lived through the, uh, an era of hyper industrialization that america had never experienced before and thought you know <laughs> hand to heart that the gee it was these great pioneers that that made the america that um, the american as we understand it and um, you know like henry james or someone like that would just laugh and laugh uh, um, at that notion you know but you, you see it in american literature that um you know there's Hemingway on the one hand, there's Fitzgerald on the other. Now, um, Fitzgerald would say that, that, that these are we, we live in society. Now, uh, we're the products of groups. That um, we're a product of influences beyond us. So that you know, Gatsby has money because he has. Uh, um, he's actually um, he's mobbed up. Now, um, where the mob come from? You know, I mean, all of this. Hemingway would have you believe that um, that you know it's just an individual soldier that you know out there wrestling with his conscious uh, conscience and his masculinity. Now, you know, I mean, these are two competing visions, and they're just as true today. And there's just as gnarly. Yeah, I, I was wondering. You know, as I was reading the book, I couldn't help but think about that tech motto, uh, move fast and break things. Uh, right. That seems to resonate so much in strong story, you know, just build more railroads, be the first to the site, have better engineers, have a brass neck. Um, so I wonder, can you compare the CEOs of the Gilded Age to the CEOs of, you know, today's, um, whatever you want to call it, the Facebooks, the, the social media tycoons? 
they're identical, uh, you know, just operating in different spheres that, at different speeds. Uh, um, one of the things that I pointed out that made the railroads a little easier to deal with was you could see them. Uh, um, you could smell them. You knew when they were going by. You could hear it. There was a roar down the tracks. Well, when some, some message is going out on the Internet, who knows? Uh, you know, how did it Nobody even knows. I mean, you ask an average person how it is that your that message on that text got to you. No clue. You know, people knew how the railroads worked. Uh, they could they could see it, and so that it was a little bit more manageable intellectually. But it was still so new, and the speed of it was so fast uh, that that was unimaginable. I have this bit that I like in the, the book about what it was like to ride a train and the strange sensation that everybody reported on initially, which I called the blur, which is this phenomenon that everybody notices now, but nobody thinks anything about it, which is that when a tr you're in a train and you're rushing down the tracks, that objects that are near you outside the window are going by in a blur and you can't even see what they are, but in the distance, that there is a kind of still panorama, that, that it, there's a kind of majesty way out there, but not close by, and that the world, in a sense, was being dematerialized, at, at least perceptually, uh, as you rush along the tracks. That really, it kind of, it didn't freak people out, but they, they found that that was very odd. Uh, um, within a few years, they didn't even mention it. No, um, and something like that is happening with the internet and the light speed that it operates at. Sounds a lot like railroads. John, the book is smashing. It's it's really good. And uh, I think it, it has so much to tell us about our society today, as well as society 100 years ago. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Michael, it's been such a pleasure. This hour is just zipped by. Uh, um, maybe we're on railroad time. Who knows? Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.